I started to kind of need control of something in my life, which is where most, you know, eating disorders do stem from. Even if we don't realize it in the back of our head, it's needing control of something because we don't feel in control of anything. And this individual kind of fed off of that and would applaud me whenever I would get smaller and smaller. And I didn't see it back then, but now almost 15 years later, looking back at it as an, as an adult, I'm like, wow. This episode, I'm Knocking Doors Down with Savannah Carmichael. She's an actress, published model, and freak show performer, which I just love about her. She does sword swallowing, fire, a uh, blockhead, just an amazing person. Savannah kindly and vulnerably goes into what led her to various eating disorders throughout her life and her struggle with her relationship with food, including being involved with individuals that would gaslight her, provoke a lot of fear, and really created a lot of codependency. We talk how she got out of it. Also, her support dog, Loki, is with her the whole time. And of course, we wrap up with random questions. If you want to know more about Savannah, hit the link in the podcast description. And hey, while you're checking Knocking Doors Down out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. Right now, I am wearing my new 5150 hat, warm leather jacket. As well, I got my new 5150 joggers on that I like to wear around the winter time. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150 LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And of course, I said it helps within the community. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. Savannah Carmichael, along with dog Ye- uh, Loki, a oh, little dog there for those that aren't watching. <laughs> she's got her dog Loki with her. Uh, thanks for joining me on Knocking Doors Down. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very, very much. Yeah, well, we've gone back and forth long enough. It's like, hey, you, you know, <laughs> you, you're doing so much to help other people. Let's let's get this out there and hopefully connect some other other individuals that can relate to your story and just let them know they're not alone. And you've just done some amazing work at, at turning your life around. And, and, you know, I want to applaud you first for getting out of and people are going to hear some of that of, of the victimhood and victim mentality because you were and empowering your life and, and taking control. So first and foremost, I want to just say I'm proud of you. You've done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I appreciate everything you guys do too. Like, it, your your show is amazing and you guys are doing some great things and looking wow. forward to seeing more thank you dear uh all right let's start with it uh gratitude three things you're grateful for today uh number one my recovery first and foremost a thousand percent like i wouldn't i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that um then obviously my friends my family including this little dude <laughs> and just my career even though it's kind of wishy-washy and getting into the groove of things, but I'm incredibly thankful for that and everybody that I'm meeting along the way. Yeah. You're doing an amazing job and, and people, you know, uh, Savannah's um, uh, links are in the podcast description, just with the, the art that you're doing, not just the modeling, the acting. Um, I want to ask about the freak show performing because people hear that and they go, Oh, they, you know, but like <laughs> no, Savannah's a, a beautiful person. You know, she's not the bearded lady. Not that we would be upset if it was the bearded lady. You know, everybody hey, gets I mean, loved. <laughs> I yeah, no, the freak show performing is really fun. Uh, I actually started that after I lost a family member, and mm-hmm. I needed 
something to kind of pull my mind out of that. And I started with fire breathing, fire eating first, and then I moved on to sword swallowing and human blockhead. So what's human blockhead? I, okay. Hopefully you're not squeamish. Um, I have about a four to five, four to seven inch nail, depending, uh, hammer it into my nasal cavity or I snap mouse traps on my tongue. I can pass a tube through my nose and out of my mouth. That's a trip. Like, it's so interesting <laughs> to me. No, because I took my kids to the Renaissance Fair, uh, my girlfriend and I, last summer. And so they loved the sword swallower and the fire breathers. And I, I dig it. I mean, I grew up a Kiss fan, so fire breathing was always oh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. If we live closer, I'd be like, teach me how. I want to Gene Simmons it. Um, I mean, you know, I'm out there a lot. So, I mean, it. I could, I could teach. It takes a little bit, though. It does take some time. And it's dangerous. So just... Yeah. Don't try to do it on your own. <laughs> no, I've, I've had people that when I've uh, brought it up, it's like, you better shave that beard off, you know, <laughs> because you might singe that <laughs> thing. Yeah. For, yeah. It's uh, it can get a little scary. <laughs> so how did you really, you know, like you said, you went through a, um, a loss of a loved one. How then did this come about as like, boy, I need to really open up my world. Was this something you had always kind of dreamed of doing and just figured now's the time or were you kind of intermingling with people that were already in that world and it just the opportunity the came freak about show stuff or yeah. like everything, the freak show stuff. I want to start there. Cause I'm fascinated. Okay, by it. So, so the freak show stuff, when I was in that place, there was a TV show um on amc called freak show it's about the venice beach freak show out in california and i just really enjoyed seeing what they did and morgue specifically just morgue's aesthetic and how morgue performed intrigued me and mm -hmm. just kind of listening to all of their stories and i was like cool i really like that that's a seems kind of fun i want to see if i can do it because something that always interested me doing stunts stuff like that and just kind of went from there and kind yeah. of found my niche for it so we talk about this a lot and i'm sure you've gone through it with your recovery and struggles is you know the opposite of addiction being connectivity and community and it's uh it's funny where we can end up finding it you know right so uh, let me let's dive into a little bit, though, of some of the struggles and things. And and like I said at the beginning, you know, you've you've ditched the victimhood and things that happened to you. But let's touch a little bit on it and, and your struggles to give people relevance of what we're going to be talking okay. about throughout, you know, the aftermath of the process and really building the awesome life, you know, that, that you have. I'm looking forward to all the success that's coming your way. I appreciate that. <laughs> So tell me about it. So where, where do we go through what, um, you know, you and I've talked, you know, eating disorder. Right. I mean, geez, you sound like you had an individual that in addition to the the sexual assault, incredible mental and emotional assault, gaslighting, all these these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of all started around the same time of losing that that family member. I'd already been in that relationship for a little bit. Um, so still really young. I was like 15 mm -hmm. uh, when it happened. And as you said, you know, there was that, that sexual assault, um, a good portion of things that happened were not consensual. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some, you know, scarring from, from that. And to tie into the whole eating thing, that's when I started to kind of need control of something in my life, which is where most, you know, eating disorders do stem from. Even if we don't realize it in the back of our head, it's needing control of something because we don't feel in control of anything. And this individual kind of fed off of that and would applaud me whenever I would get smaller and smaller. And I didn't see it back then, but now almost 15 years later, looking back at it as an, as an adult, I'm like, wow. Wow. Like I really, you don't understand it when you're in that mindset, but I really let somebody take advantage of me like that. And was just basically a doormat and just let it happen. Cause I mean, at that point you don't, you don't feel like there's really a way out. You just kind of feel like, Oh, well, this is life. This is, I'm used to it. Like I, I don't deserve anything better. So I just stayed, um, and it wasn't until I got a lot older that I was like, yeah, no, I can't, 
I, I got to pull myself out of, I got to do something different. And, you know, finally got out of that situation and then a lot of, a lot of therapy. Yeah. Well, and that's good that you bring that up to, you know, I, I personally, as someone that continues to go through therapy, be it group or individual, it's important that, that we get that out, that we lift that load off of our minds and our hearts. And um, how, how long did this relationship last? Cause it started, you were around 15 four to five years oh, before I finally cut ties with that person completely. Yeah. Um, Cause I was afraid to, I was afraid to cut ties sure. because of, you know, like you were saying the gaslighting, the threats, I was afraid to cut ties. So it took me being an adult to finally be like, yeah, no. Cause the bullshit that they put on us and gets put on. So tell me if this is for you. Cause this is for me as someone that was already just struggling, didn't have the tools mentally, emotionally, had some scars that I was unable to even recognize or see or see that they were there. Cause I seemed to be in a group that some of the stuff that I was thinking and feeling was normalized, so to speak, or my acting out was normalized, you know? So the drinking or pornography or, you know, Hey, we get drunk and go out and chase girls or whatever stupid, pointless crap that it right. was. So it was hard for me to really identify um, that, wow, I've put myself in a situation where I have an individual that is not only mirroring the thoughts that I had about myself because of my struggles, but enhancing the hell out of it and reinforcing it over and over and over. Yeah, it it, it was like that um, because honestly, at that point, I was also struggling with self-harm. Yeah. Um I mean, granted, I, I hit it very well, but that's part of the reason why I do have tattoos all over my arms, other than the fact that I love them, um, covering, scarring. Sure. Um, but I, I, I get that mindset because at that point I was already doing those things to myself. And I had this person that at first was like, hey, we're great. I'm going to, you know, give you all this attention, all this good things, all this love. And then it turned and then in my brain, because all that was going on, I'm like, no, but they love me. Right. So this isn't this because they love me. It's allowed. Again, it's not until I got older that I'm like, no, no, I still said no. That's that's not okay. <laughs> um, but it was already in my brain with with having going through the self harm, the depression, and obviously that was escalating that, um, and not really eating was escalating that on top of that because your brain doesn't fire correctly when you're in that place yeah no I didn't see it at that time and I just thought that hey you know this is this is where I'm supposed to be like this is what this is life and it absolutely was not life <laughs> yeah we get that this is life or this is or even for me tell me if you this sounds for this is love this is how love yeah. is. It's 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 fiery, passionate, and then there, you know, either direction, the the, the, the arguments, the anger, then the you know, the makeup and all that. It's just a, it's a process of continually activating our nervous system, and it's so familiar because it's it's doing the same thing to our brain that trauma did, you know, over right. and over and over. And in a way, it does kind of create that trauma bond because your brain is thinking this is love, but the person's hurting you, so. You don't know what to do and you attach because that's your brain's like, no, don't let them go because they're paying attention to us, even though they're hurting you. Yeah. Well, and you said it right there. That's it. And I see so many people struggle. Look, attention doesn't equal love. It, it's no. hard to get there. You know it. I know it. But attention does not equal love. Never has, never will. That's not how this works. So sometimes the people that love you the most, it's not. They're not going to flood you with constant attention. They're not going to love bomb you. It does not work that right. way. Right. And then it comes to a point where when you do get genuine care from somebody, even if it's not at a romantic sense, you're kind of like, what, what the ulterior motive here? Like what, what are you doing? Yeah. How long did it take you to really even start to open up about these struggles after getting away from that relationship? I kind of pick and chose who I let in. Um, one of my best friends, since I've had since 10th grade, 
she didn't even know anything about it until I was 21. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were outside of a coffee shop and their car had driven past. And I just remember breaking down and shaking and she just kind of looked at me and I told her about as much as I could. And then I told her who it was because she knew the person. Mm. Um, but she didn't even know for years. And I mean, there's family members of mine that still don't fully know what went on. Um, part of them still think that it's consensual and it probably won't be until this podcast that they hear this, that they'll find out that some of it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I don't want to not bum somebody out, but I don't ever want to put that on somebody, especially a parent. I understand that. I, I, I know what you mean. And it, and it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to figure out who we can and can't talk about openly. I think that's why group stuff is so important. Uh, is, you know, especially if you can get crosstalk going and kind of other people share perspectives, their stories and so on. But um, yeah, it's, it's really tough. You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm glad you got out of it. Cause I mean, like, you know, we were talking, you went through sexual assault with this and then, you know, the eating disorder started and this person was reinforcing it, you know, um, gosh, anyways, I was <laughs> trapped to avoid getting emotional. What, what, when did you really start to address the eating disorder and, and what was that process like for you? And really how long did it take until you started to eat? you know, like get a healthy relationship with food or is it still a struggle at times? Um, I am two years into recovery. Um, I had a typical anorexia and bulimia. Um, I want to kind of lean to say atypical bulimia because sword swallower. Um, I wasn't the regular bulimic. Mine was a massive laxative addiction. Mm. Um, so I'm about two years into recovery for both of those. Um, it, funny enough, it was another friend of mine that is two years into their recovery for um, hard substances. Uh, I've been friends with them for years, kind of watched them go back and forth on, you know, being sober and then unfortunately relapsing. And they were finally like, dude, I can't. I can't keep doing this. I got to break the cycle. I got to work the steps. Um, Let's do it together. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll try. And I honestly cannot thank him enough. Like, I I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for that conversation. Um, I probably would not be in the shape that I'm in right now. That's a thousand percent. And I completely love him for that. Yeah. So did you, uh, you say work in the steps, did, were, did you start attending meetings? Was it where he was bringing like the AA big book? What was the setting for that? He, so when we started, he lived in a couple hours away in another spot. And then I moved out of North Carolina. Um, so we've just been video calling each other. He's been telling me about his, you know, his step work and stuff that he's doing in his meetings. And we're just kind of bouncing off back and forth from each other and helping with tips. And he, in his recovery, you know, was power lifting and was able to give his energy to that. And I'm like, okay, well, how do I get into working out like that without it going crazy and falling into the like overly obsessiveness that I was doing. And he was starting to help me kind of work through that. And I mean, tough love, honestly, he doesn't, he doesn't sugarcoat things when he talks to me. He's been my best friend for years. So, I mean, <laughs> he knows how to talk to me yeah. and he'll eventually just be like, you know what? Shut up. Listen to me. Stop your brain for a second. And he's kind of helped me learn how to not go into a crazy mindset when I'm into the gym. And then of course me, obviously I'm working my own steps in a way they're not really steps it's a a little separate different process for the anorexia side of things but definitely for the laxative addiction i had to go through those steps because i was utterly dependent on them to the point where if i i I didn't have x amount on me right i would panic i would shake and i would be like no i need to go to the store i need to do this i need to do that and you know, there were times where I OD'd on them. Oh like that is 
that is possible. Um, you're essentially in massive amounts of pain, you know, writhing on the bathroom floor, praying for anything to make it stop. Um, and I did, I bargained. Yeah. And then the next day I went back and did it again. So um, it, right. it, it, it did end up becoming an addiction. Um, and that was a little bit harder to, to get through, but I'm, I'm glad that I stopped when I did before I did even worse damage sure. to myself. Yeah. Yeah. People don't. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that the, the misconceptions or misunderstandings about, you know, eating disorders and things that people don't realize the, you know, not just uh, our body, but the, the brain and the, the the individual as a whole, that there can become points where there isn't a comeback from um, right. as far as a, you know, a restorative health, there can be those long-term for the rest of your, your life issues that are just going to be there. Right. And I do, I do have some, some yeah. issues because of it. I have, I have food sensitivities now because of the restriction and, you know, the abuse and then the yo-yoing and doing whatever and all of the fads. And yeah, I, I do have food sensitivities now because of it, but I'm learning to like find the right supplement routines and to help me kind of get through the day and maybe things that'll help me with those food sensitivities to not have as a severe reaction to them because it kind of sucks not being able to eat bread (laughs) 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 so like now that i can and now that i'm not in that like the space i'm like really now now you're gonna rebel against me like it it's it's a whole process um I'm not going to lie, even being two, two years into recovery, I still do get moments where, you know, I think I'm good and then I'll go out to eat with somebody and I won't even be in my brain panicking about it, but I'll just start having a panic attack. Sure. Just being in the parking lot of a restaurant and have to kind of ground myself. If I don't have him with me to do it, you know, I do have ways to like ground myself and kind of bring myself back to reality. Thankfully, um, one of the times it happened, I was in Vegas with a group of models and I had to step outside and one of them was just an absolute sweetheart. And she came out with me and kind of sat with me until I calmed down. And she's like, Hey, do you just want me to order you something? So you don't have to look at it. Like, I understand this is hard for you. And, you know, she helped me order food and we all just kind of sat there and nobody really judged me for how I was eating or how slow or how quick or whatever the case may have been. Like they were all super sweet about the whole situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for people that are just listening, when Savannah referred to him, her uh, support dog, Loki, who is a certified trained support dog, uh, which is, uh, we were talking before we started recording a little bit out of the norm when people think support animal, cause he's a Chihuahua mix of some kind, right? No, this one, this one is a straight chihuahua. The one oh, okay. that's sleeping in the other room is the mix. Oh. <laughs> no, he's, he's all Applehead. Oh, yeah, he's a sweet, sweet dog. Uh, so when you talk about that, though, that made me wonder, you know, the, um, you know, eat as slow as you want or the process. So is there, do you have to have an inner dialogue with yourself when it comes to meals, regular eating patterns? Because I've kind of gone through that, too, with the self-loathing of, you know, telling myself, well, I'm not worthy of better food, whole food, real food, you know, right. um, or just a meal in general. You know, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't necessarily say i had an eating disorder maybe as others classify but i definitely went through periods of where i'm not worthy of this nourishment that that still does sound in a way uh disordered eating you don't have to be first of all i just want to preface this you don't have to be a female to deal with it it hits anybody no matter what gender no matter what age no matter what size you don't have to be a skeleton to be classified because nobody starts out that way um at all like there are people that are of different weights that that have that and you don't have to have all of the clinical symptoms to have those issues which is where things like atypical come in Mm -hmm. um but yeah no i do there there are times where i do have to kind of have that inner dialogue because it's never really something that goes away it always is in the back of your brain. You just kind of get better at telling it to, you know, screw off. 
um, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to do what I want because I want this. Like you can't control me anymore. Um, and you do kind of have to have that back and forth with yourself, but especially now that I'm, you know, back in the gym and then I'm weightlifting and then I'm, you know, trying to, you know, maintain my protein content. I, I've had a friend of mine help me figure it out. Um, how to, I don't want to say hack into an app, but they, they, they kind of jailbroke an app for me to where it doesn't show me calorie content. Mm. It'll just show me my protein that mm. I'm trying to focus on. So that way I don't get thrown into the numbers and this and that and the third, because then you can end up going back into, you know, restricting and right. all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, because then you get the calorie count and you're like, oh, my God, I mean, 3,500 calories in a day. Oh, my God, I'm going to be, you know, gain weight or whatever. And now in the recovery, I do I do just want to say, especially for anybody that's listening, especially if you are an adult, 1,200 calories a day is not sustainable. It's not even enough calories for a four-year-old toddler. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. the calories aren't as important as what you're doing. You don't have to. And getting into that mindset for me was hard, but you don't have to always eat clean. You mm. don't have to always eat a certain thing. And I had to be really careful about that, especially, you know, with weightlifting and stuff They you know, tell you to eat cleaner, mm -hmm. all that fun stuff. Uh, but I've already had two and I don't want to risk <laughs> jumping into the whole orthorexia because that's, that's the whole third one of, orthorexia is you know you eat super super clean and you're super obsessed with exercise it's not so much the restriction it's people that restrict so far down on not processed and no salts and no this and no that that their body is breaking down because you do need the carbs you do need the salts like your body can't function without carbs right. your brain can't function which is why most people that deal with that especially the anorexia side get airheaded, uh, yeah. have memory loss, like, yeah. cause your body can't function. Yeah. Your, your brain, your brain can't function no matter how much we try to trick ourselves into thinking that, you know, a monster zero is a meal. It's not. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it, in addition to that, Savannah, I mean, you know, healthy fats, people have such misconceptions about that too. I mean, fat is a necessary part of, for the body, for brain function, right. and, you know, all these other things like, yeah, you, you need to get some fat in your diet, not saturated fat, you know, learn to distinguish what they are. But yeah, it's like you need some fat. And, you know, carbs aren't your enemy. And that was, you know, the biggest thing for me. It was about a year into recovery. I was like, OK, cool. Well, I'm eating. I'm just going to do, you know, a carb free. And during this time, my friend was sitting there, we were sitting there talking and I was like, man, remember when I was vegan? Cause I, I was making breakfast. I had breakfast food, I had meat, stuff like that. And they were like, yeah, I just didn't say anything. Cause at least you were eating something, but I knew that was your eating disorder brain. Sure. He was, he was right. He, he was right. I went that because it was easy to make it look like I had a lot without it actually being a lot, but I was doing the whole no carb thing. Yeah, that didn't work out so well because I went and ran three miles, felt great that day. Got up the next morning, literally walked maybe the five steps to my bathroom, went to, you know, tried to go to the bathroom in the morning and then woke up in between the wall and the toilet. Oh Somehow I, I blacked out because I didn't have carbs in my system. And I went and did this high intensity cardio workout the day before and my body just couldn't function. And I was like, Oh, okay. So I need carbs. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm just glad you didn't fall and like hit your head or something serious. Or I went this way instead of this way, which was good. Cause this way I would have hit my head on the bathtub, but I don't know how I folded. Cause that wasn't, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And then I literally texted my buddy. I'm like, Hey, can you, um, can you go get me orange juice and bread from the store? I think I need carbs. Well, being that you become sensitive to things like breads, what, what kind of approach do you have to take with carbohydrates? Um, well, I'm not going to lie. Um, I know I'm, I'm sensitive to gluten. Um, that doesn't mean I won't eat it. It's like any lactose intolerant person. They're still going to eat cheese. Like there are moments where I'll just take the hit and be like, I'll be in pain for a little bit. Um, uh, but finding those bread substitutes, it, it, it's a process because some of sure. them taste like 
sponges. Like, <laughs> right. they're, they're not the most fluffy and nice and warming, but, you know, thankfully a lot of corn stuff and I love, you know, Mexican food. So yeah. that's a helpful, you know, all corn tortillas. Um, they do make gluten-free pastas. And then I found imported pastas from like Italy and stuff like that, that aren't made here. Don't have the same wheat that we use and people with that sensitivity it's easier to process them so i just have to either go find those or i eat a lot of rice or you know corn yeah. products so yeah um let me ask you with you know being that you're doing modeling now and i'm seeing it i don't know about you especially you know younger people and how sadly influential social media and the stories they tell themselves about themselves and life and achievement it's really dicking with a lot of people it, it, it messes with adults let alone younger people um how do you really kind of navigate social media i mean you, you know you put out some really great content you share your modeling Thank photos you. things that you do um even little you know bits of your story positive af you know encouraging things how do you navigate that with knowing you know the struggles that you went through i mean I, you know i don't know if you classify it as a disease addiction i know i do it is because it's not like anybody just wakes up and goes i'm gonna go be an addict today or hey i'm gonna go give myself an eating disorder like those aren't things that people choose and they they shouldn't be looked down on for having had those struggles because at the end of the day everybody has something that takes the pain away. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a little more intense for some people as opposed to others. And, uh, but navigating that in all honesty, I kind of view it as for me now, I'm being the person that I wish little me had. Um, you know, when I, you know, I was in school, I couldn't really express myself all that much just because of the schools that I went to. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of being the person that, you know, little middle school, little high school, me, even elementary school, me would have like looked up to and would have appreciated. And I also just kind of want to put it out there for people, you know, that are struggling that it, it can get better. It doesn't seem like it, but it can, um, you know, I had granted, there's also the ugly side of social media where some people that, you know, don't, don't care to get better still post themselves. And I, I did have to block those people even now as in recovery. I had to block those people mm -hmm. um, just because I can't as much as I really want the best for this particular uh, young woman. She's about my age. Uh, she's, I, I can't, I can't cause it's, mm -hmm. it, it'll trigger me back into things just seeing her photos. Sure. Um, so I don't ever want, to make somebody else feel that way about what I post. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of why I'm open about a lot of it. Like not all of my photos are po perfectly posed. You know, there's some photos where I, you know, I do have my skin folding over, whatever, whatever. Um, that's normal. That's the human body. If you didn't have that extra skin, you would literally break apart. Right. And that's why I, I try to pick those companies that do kind of showcase a wider of a range of bodies because I, you know, I think showing beauty in all forms is beautiful. You don't have to look a certain way to be considered beautiful. Everybody has their own beauty in them. And that was the biggest thing for me is everybody was like, Oh, well you were sick. So if you thought you were that, that, then you must think I'm that. And no, like that's, that's the thing is most people with, with the eating disorders, they have body dysmorphia for themselves. Yeah. Like even now I still shopping for myself. I have to physically go off of being a model. I have to keep my measurements. So I physically have to look at those measurements and look at a chart and be like, okay, cool. So I'm not three sizes larger than what I am mm -hmm. because my brain will instinctively go, no, you're this. Yeah. You still look like this. Yeah. And, but we don't see other people like that. There could be somebody that's 600 pounds and I can still be like, oh, you're beautiful. Like, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Like, you're gorgeous. Like, we don't, you don't see somebody else like that. It's all, I don't want to say internalized, but it is, it's an, it's an internal thing. It's a self thing. Yeah. It's uh, the reflection in the mirror, 100%. Yeah. So with my social media, I just, I just kind of be real in all honesty. I, 
I be as vulnerable as I can to a degree, um, sure. just because especially with social media, you do get a couple people that want to kind of breach that and crawl in a little bit further into your personal space. And you're just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, <laughs> take a breather for a second. <laughs> so I get as vulnerable as I can, but I don't ever want to get looked at like a victim. And right. I mean, granted, yes, I am. I, I prefer the term survivor for from both because in all honesty, you know, I survived, I survived all that. Um, and I try not to let it define me. I, I do open up about my life and what I've gone through with people just so that they understand, mm-hmm. you know, I do have, you know, a little bit of PTSD. I have night terrors and stuff. So granted, you know, if I'm staying over or have friends over or whatever, I'm like, Hey, just <laughs> FYI, this could be a possibility. You know, he's trained to help me out, but this could mm-hmm. happen. Um, but being vulnerable on social media, I feel like if, if I can help one person that's even just even beginning to struggle with what I struggled through, not go down as hard as I did. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's all that matters to me because I wouldn't ever wish anything that I went through on anybody else. Um, It was not a fun time in my life. You know, it makes your depression worse. It makes your emotions go haywire. It it ends up making you hate yourself for for no reason. And it wasn't until I want to say about this year that I was finally able to walk in front of a mirror and be like, you know what? Damn, I, I look good today. (laughs) <laughs> and you know that took that not to sound you know cocky or anything with that but it getting to that point honestly felt kind of cool and being able to go to the gym now and not focus on oh well i ate this so i gotta punish myself and do x amount of cardio right weightlifting is where it's at You'd have to like, I, I hate cardio now. <laughs> um, I look back at myself back in those days and I'm like, girl, like, why didn't you just pick up the weights? You could have seen progress. You could have gotten stronger. And at the end of the day, that's that's because I do share some of the fitness stuff on my page. And that's just part of trying to be a representation in a way of what I don't see a lot in especially the fitness industry and just having somebody like, like me that can be like, Hey, listen, I've been through it. You don't gotta do this, the X, Y, Z to yourself to get results in the gym. You know, you can eat those Cheetos. You can, you can have McDonald's once in a while, just enjoy yourself. If you don't stress yourself out over these things, you'll end up feeling better. And at the end of the day, that's why I go to the gym. Now I go, just because I feel better after I go and not seeing it as a form of punishment. And that's kind of what I want to get across when I do post about the gym and stuff. I don't want to post to being like, you have to have this rigorous routine and this, this, this. No, no, you can literally go for 30 minutes a day. As long as you're doing something, you can't let that part of your brain dictate your life anymore. Yeah. Because it, it got bad to a point where my brain was like, oh, cool. You ate this. You now have to do X, Y, Z. Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which didn't constitute that. And it's a whole thought process. Like it's, it's a lot mentally. I think it's very familiar for me with, you know, the negotiation, you know, it's the more I do this, the more people I talk to struggle with any form of addiction is that negotiation process that, you know, continues to just be one of the worst parts of it, you know, and Mm -hmm. like you're saying, you know, with what you're doing, um with with your work and sharing it i i i love and why you know through we've had some dir- direct messages co- encouraging conversations that i really want to talk to you because i think it's so important for no matter what it is you're going through if it's a you know a chemical addiction an eating disorder i mean there's the gambling you know there really is no outside solution to this internal problem um you know and it's not an insult to any anyone but i would much rather have my children follow someone like you that's open and honest as opposed to these unrealistic expectations of what can happen you know i i've gone through it since i was a kid you know i grew up loving 
WWF at the time wrestling and, you know, wanted to, wanted, to, <laughs> wanted to look like Hulk Hogan or the ultimate warrior. And, you know, I'm six two, a buck 80, and this is about as heaviest as I've ever been. I probably got heavier during my drinking days just because I was so bloated. But, you know, it's like, this is my body. I'm never going to be a 280 pound guy naturally. It's not going to happen. So it was a process to just love who and what I am. And, right. and, be confident in it. And I think sometimes people misconstrue confidence. Like the, the expectation was that, you know, every woman or the vast majority are going to find me attractive. It's like, I could, I, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I've I, I got one that loves me and I love her and we appreciate each other. And, um, you know, it, it really, it has nothing to do with content of character at the end of the right. day. And I think too many people judge content of character, as some external thing or what people have or, you know, and it's, um, I think it's just kind of a dangerous thing. And, you know, I just, that's what I appreciate you about interjecting your work that you share also with your story that, you know, makes it a good thing to like, I like to follow it. I, I like <laughs> to follow you and people like you. And then hopefully people get that out of what I do, you know, because end of the day, it's all personal responsibility. When it comes to social right. media, I see it so much, especially with Twitter right now. People, oh, this is in my feed. It's like, you do know you can mute this stuff, right? You do right. know you have control over what you do and don't see and content you take in. At the end of the day, you have control. You are not powerless to this stuff. It's just that simple. Yeah, and uh, I, I really, I, I appreciate you saying all of that. I do it. It makes me feel, makes me feel really nice that you know somebody does see what I'm what I I'm I'm trying to put across in my stuff here um and at the, you know at the end of the day I'm not going to knock anybody you know anybody that is on Instagram and is just strictly modeling and maybe is too scared to tell their story mm -hmm. I can't knock them for that like it's it's a whole thought it, it's it's a process but I've met some of the most amazing people in being open about my recovery. And like you said, at the end of the day, it's, you know, character over anything. And uh, at the end of the day, I'd rather be in a room full of people that have recovered and are open about their stories and are just genuine human beings than, you know, somebody else that I can't get a read off of them because everything is the same. Yeah. Um, I would feel a thousand times safer in a room full of all of my friends that have been in recovery and everybody I know because I know they understand it and they won't judge me for it and they won't look at me kind of weird or whatever. Cause it's, it's harder to explain to somebody that hasn't gone through that mindset about that mindset. Cause they don't understand it. Like most people, when they hear eating disorder, they think, Oh, you just hate food. Mm. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. no, trust me. I was dreaming of like cheeseburgers and tacos the whole time, but <laughs> Had to find a good, healthier path. <laughs> Savannah, did you ever at any point struggle with substances or you were pretty good about staying away from abusing any substances? I mean, obviously beyond the the um, the laxatives and stuff and such. Um, as far as abuse and those go, no, to a degree. Um. But at that point, it was when my depression had gotten to the point where I was basically stockpiling the substances that I had been prescribed to try to. Um, mm. So I didn't fall into that mainly because my brain was so addicted on hurting myself. Sure. Um, that was that was my addiction because that was my chemical release and my brain was for lack of a better word, turning my, my arms and legs into a horror movie. Right. Um, right. Uh. And that release, cause it, it does, it'll release a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of serotonin. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pain response. Uh, that, that was the addiction part to me. Um, and so I kind of think I stayed away from the other things, even though like my brain was like, Hey, that'll make it go away quicker. Mm -hmm. my brain was still too focused on yeah but this is here now you yeah. don't got to go look for that this is here now do this yeah mm. so 
Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, hey, let's uh, let's talk a little more fun. I'm seeing an umbrella. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing an awesome Umbrella Academy uh, tattoo. So I got to ask about that and uh, and uh, some of your other tattoos because I. Got, oh yeah, know. no, uh, love Gerard Way. Uh, yeah. Love my chem. I have a My Chemical Romance tattoo on my leg. <laughs> Right definitely still an emo kid if you ever went through that phase it never leaves you um i actually got into the umbrella academy about the time i was 15 when they came out or back when they came out i don't remember how old i was exactly i've slept since then but uh got into them and fell in love with it and then the show came out and they did a fantastic time with that so i got to nerd out a little bit and reminisce um so that was fun and then i have on that arm the mad hatter's hat if you can see it yeah that is from american mcgee's alice it's a kind of horror alice video game and then i have the cutting shears in there those are actually a scale model of my hair cutting scissors because i do have my cosmetology license um so i have those there um on this side not really super deep meaning here just a haunted house that i i loved and was my first american traditional piece I dig it. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> my goal is to get more. I've, I've, you know, I'm kind of almost done with the full left arm, and we'll keep going from there. So, you know, it's kind right. of a thing that maybe it's weird. I mean, a lot of people have tattoos now, but there's still a lot of misconceptions or judgments about it, and sometimes it's just, uh, you know, putting those things on our skin that uh, have significance to us. Like, you know, when we sat down with Kat Von D, when you know, Mikey, my co-host, was still, you know, part of the show at her house and we were talking about it. she's like some of my favorite tattoos were the most simplest work i did it's because of the story behind it you know there was right. you know i can't remember what it, what it was but she was talking about the it was a um, lady that like lost her her kid and it's it was something really simple but it's you know those beautiful stories behind it for us right and that um my next tattoo is actually going to be the uh, national eating disorder awareness symbol somewhere on me uh just have to figure out where and when I'm going to get it because I've gotten questions about my chest tattoo as well. Like, you know, why did you get the hawk moth on your chest? You know, da, da, da. and this is, you know, my rebirth piece. Um, I got it shortly, you know, trying to go into recovery the first time. I uh, didn't really stick second time or third, fourth, whatever time I'm on at this point, I've lost count. Uh, this one stuck. Yeah. still sticking so right i still on. constitute this as my rebirth and my like new life piece i do however still do want to get the uh the symbol on me somewhere before we get to random questions i want to ask you you know just picking your brain i know kind of my process and still working it um how did you start to rebuild trust and healthy boundaries with people oh uh that was a process um it was a very slow process. I kept, I kept my circle very, very, very small. Um, I've always been super introverted unless I get around the right people that I feel safe around. Uh, I will always tell people, you know, if I feel safe around you, if I will not be afraid to eat in front of you. If mm -hmm. I don't know you, I don't feel safe around you. I do have a harder time doing things like that still. Um, but people that I feel safe around, I have no problem talking about going to get food or going to get food with you sure uh at the end of the day as i got older it was me having to i don't want to say retrain my brain but kind of pull myself out of that mindset and be like hey i essentially kind of slap myself and be like they are not that person mm -hmm. don't judge them off of what that person did to you because they are not them and you know, it's a slow process and I do have a very small select circle of people that I, I do trust or that all, you know, go to see, go to hang out with. Um, and at the end of the day, it was pushing past that fear and being like, look, these dudes aren't those dudes. You've been talking with them for a while. Right. Go hang out with them. Go see what they're about. Sure. You know, go be their friend. And I have some of the most amazing freaking friends because of that. <laughs> uh, it's it. It's it's hard, you know, because I had to go through it, too, that, you know, and a lot of people did me a favor. I don't know about you with it because, you know, a bit a bit different, you know, my primarily disease or, and drug of choice, 
uh, so to speak, you know, alcohol is like this social thing. But once I really right. got out of that and doing that, you know, some people just went away. They, they just did me the favor and they went away. I had, I've had a couple like that too. Um, some of them were online. And as soon as I was like, Hey, I'm going to recover. They just disappeared. Stop talking to me and blocked yeah. me. And I'm like, okay, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> Or as soon, you know, as soon as I got better, those friends kind of pulled away because they couldn't, I don't want to say get that control over me, but get that control over me because they had food going to my brain now. Like you, you can't, you can't take advantage of me now because I can think. <laughs> yeah. like, no, I, I know what you mean. You know, I was stop putting poison, little, little, literally putting poison in my body a, a good amount on a consistent ba basis, normally daily. That yeah, like my thinking isn't what it was before. You know, some people they right. still want to throw me into that mode of thinking. You know, and that they're going to walk all over me. And it's like, yeah, that's that's. I'm sorry, that's not the case, and it's not going to be the case. You know. Yeah, and I've had to cut off some people, um, model wise. Just because they're like, oh, well, you have a shoot coming up. You need to not eat for X, Y, Z. And I'm like, mm, no, no. Mm -hmm. The brand knows me. They know what I look like. Even if I'm doing the one doing the shoot, because I do, you know, do take some of my own photos. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through that because that'll send my brain down into a spiral. I'm like, you, no, can't do it. At the end of the day, you, got, you, you know, personal responsibility and, and mastery of self, you know, we got to take control of us. Right. You know, to the best of our ability, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, to a degree. Um, I've been slacking on drinking my water and hydrating. So I'm going through, you know, the horrible process of having to go to the bathroom every five minutes <laughs> and to get back on track with that. But. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, hey, let's have some fun. All right. I'm down. Some random questions. Um, hey, being that you're 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 really starting to explore the other side of your art and stretch into uh, acting, um, is there any one role that's out there, or maybe something that has yet to be created on screen in any sort of way that you would love to have the chance to tackle that role? Yet to be created. That is a very big statement. But um, if you can't tell from you know my shirt and honestly my appearance, I love horror movies. Yeah. Um, would absolutely love if you know because there's rumors about there being another saw movie and a third terrifier would love to work on either one of those like i'm just saying i art could like off me i'd be good i'd be happy <laughs> i could be put in a saw trap and i'd be happy uh, I'd be super happy put me in a chucky film i'd probably laugh watching chucky run at me for a couple of seconds try to take him home but all right I would love to do scary stuff, spooky stuff, but you know, I'm open to a little bit of everything, action, comic book. Um, really excited about the whole possibility of a Five Nights at Freddy's thing going on. Really excited to see how they do that. But as far as like comics, there are, there are so many comics that haven't been brought to the screen yet that I think that in itself, instead of them just trying to play off of the same old stories and do remakes of old movies that have already been done. Pull from those comic books that haven't been done yet. There's like, there's entire generations of people that were raised on these books that would love to see them on the screen. Yeah. And I feel like that is a very untapped niche kind of market that could be brought forward, like more out. I mean, just look at what Stranger Things did. Most people would bully the kids that played D and D or whatever. And now everybody's starting to like look into what D and D is and, you know, music from the eighties is blowing back up, which I'm not mad about. because like, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally down for driving down and the radio, start playing some Metallica or some kiss. Cause like, it's what I listen to anyway. Right. Um, but just seeing that and seeing, you know, the kids start getting into D and D again, which, you know, I got bullied for playing D and D that was cool to me. Like, I'm like, cool. Like, awesome. No, I'm with you. I mean, I, yeah, I remember getting bagged on for showing up with a Motley Crue t-shirt as a kid, you know, <laughs> to grade school and all those things and being into the comic books. And and there really is. It's, I mean, it's it's like great that Hollywood's finally gone. Oh, OK. Wow. This comic book writing is really good because it was shunned for so long. And when they were made, they were just terrible. 
Like, <laughs> like, you know, the, the people, the first Captain America movie, when I bring it up, they're like, yeah, that was good. I'm like, no, 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 no. The first Captain America movie. It was shit. the first Hulk movie. <laughs> oh, God. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, and that's kind of one of the only ones that was in public lexicon was like, you know, because of the Hulk TV show that was that was out there. And, um, you know, I remember they they had the Hulk TV movie and Thor was in it and it was just so bad. And yeah, you know, yeah. But, uh, but it's it's getting there. We'll see. And I think things like the Umbrella Academy and the boys and, um, you know, these these stories that us, the comic book fans have loved for a long time. They're finally putting it out because there is there's just a deeper nuance to it. You know, like I, I loved the Batman movie as Batman being my favorite comic book character of all times because it brought this darkness to it. It it brought out more right. of the, the world's greatest detective. And, you know, because it really You're was talking about the most recent one, the most recent one. Yeah. Robert Pattinson just yeah. watched that the other day. Finally, <laughs> it took me a minute, but I finally watched it. It was really good. He did. Yeah. He did great. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful and like what they did even with the Joker movie of digging into the psychology of this individual and and, you know, showing like, you know, how does an individual like this come about? Of course, you know, it's over dramatized because that's what right. stories do. But, you know, these are all real things that people are facing. And, you know, I think hopefully a lot of people after they watch that movie, I got in conversations of like, yeah, this happens to people. Uh, not not to the extent like, you know, here, this is a fictitious story, but this happens and we can't continue to ignore these things as a society. These are our fellow people that need help because otherwise they do get down some roads. Like there's there's a lot of there's some movies are just movies to be movies, but there are some that like you can find a deeper meaning in and like as crazy as it is. John Kramer and Saul had a point with what mm. he was doing he was trying to make people appreciate their life mm. cra cra crazy method crazy method we're not gonna i'm not gonna hold any qualms there for that guy a little, a little crazy there but yeah. like you get deeper meaning in everything and everybody's like well how do you get deeper meaning from the umbrella academy and i'm like read the book yeah read the book because you get a little bit more i don't want to say insight but you do get more insight and i kind of saw like where Gerard was kind of pulling for like family and just different thought processes and the personalities of the characters and everything like that. And then seeing that come to life on the big screen, not, not in the way I thought it was going to, uh, Klaus was a lot different than what I imagined. Sure. But <laughs> fantastic though. Um, definitely would not have changed that character at all on the big screen. The irony of, of Klaus, I started watching and I can't remember the name of it, but a British TV show, the actor yeah. that plays Klaus was in this British TV show and his superpower in that show was that he couldn't die either. And I was like, oh, that's good typecasting, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, brilliant, brilliant show. All right. Here, we'll, we'll try to get some more quicker ones here. Uh, you're on a deserted island. You have one movie and one uh, artist greatest hits album with you. What are they? You're gonna do that to me. I am. Oh, <laughs> that's not fair. I do this to all my friends, Savannah. Ooh, that's not fair. Um, ooh. one. You said one artist greatest hits. It could be any, you know, a band or a single individual. Oh, that's not fair. Because if I pick Metallica, then I'm giving up Kiss and Journey. But then I have the new school emo, my cam. Dude. <laughs> uh, well, you said you get what it is like the saw the saw premise, especially the first one. You get one. Man, okay. So movie. Um Seed of Chucky, because it makes me laugh and I never get tired of it. <laughs> All right. Uh probably. I it that's just the first thing that popped into my head. I have a Chucky doll over here, so that I looked and <laughs> yeah. Um artist greatest hits. That one's going to be the hardest one for me to answer because, like, I live and breathe music, dude. Oh, Journey. Journey. It would have to be Journey because I would need something upbeat. Mm -hmm. I hate that I'm throwing Kiss and Metallica and Mike and all that to the, to the wind there, but ah, Journey. 
hopefully I don't go too crazy. <laughs> yeah, you got to remember you're on a deserted island. We didn't say for how long. So, hey, something to keep you going, you know. Don't stop believing just on a loop. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh you could have one superpower what would it be teleportation yeah so i wouldn't have to be stuck in traffic oh the worst right yeah or, or like you know dealing with tsa getting on a plane and you know all that yeah, oh, yeah. you just blink and you're there teleportation yeah. you could have uh dinner with any one person living or not who would they be honestly i'd have to go through like writers uh poe probably edgar Allan poe yeah That's or emily one. dickinson poetry like poet wise because i i read a lot growing up shakespeare the odyssey yeah. stuff like that so it would probably end up being one of those writers from back then that i read growing up yeah. just to kind of pick their brain and see what was going on absolutely yeah you picked poe one of my favorites too so you picked the yeah. good one there uh savannah the the floor is yours you kind of want to share some knowledge from your life experience with others people that are struggling maybe a loved one they have is struggling whatever it's uh what what might you share with someone so coming from the point of the person who's been in it and this is talking to like parents um what you say can affect your kid. Like, even if you think it's harmless, joking about, oh, you're you're going to eat that? You just ate. Just kind of be mindful because it you don't know who's pre predisposition to this. It'll just trigger at any moment. Also, in the same circumstance, though, for parents of people who are struggling, it may not have been your fault. It may not have been anything you said or did. It can just happen. There are parents that don't even make those jokes to their kids or those jokes didn't affect the kid. And it was something at school that triggered it, like the homework load or the stress load or the stress somewhere else. Like, just kind of be a little bit more mindful. And if your kid is struggling, be patient because um, they don't even understand what's going on in their own head at that time. They just know something is yelling at them to do this or to do that or to not eat this or that like just patience is the biggest thing and to anybody that is going through any type of addiction whether it be you know substances or like what I went through with self-harm or the eating disorder specifically with the self-harm and eating disorder it's it's worth it to try it's worth it to try to get out like even if you feel like you're not worthy of getting out of that hole in that dark place you, you are and you're worthy of living a life that you're just happy not having to stress over things and just go enjoy it with your friends they miss you i promise you they miss you because i know if there's anybody listening that's going through this and is you know cutting out time with their friends to go to the gym for way too many hours they miss you they miss you way more than you think they do when they notice that you're gone. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about. This podcast contains the views and opinions of the Knocking Doors Down hosts and their guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is sharing their unique perspective, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. Privacy is of the utmost importance to us. For those wishing anonymity, people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality at the request of certain guests. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with their content establish a doctor-patient relationship. 
If you find any errors in any of the content of this podcast or blogs, please send a message through the contact page. This podcast is owned by KDD Media Company.